We're going to continue uh, this plenary session, an introduction or primer to the U.S. electoral system, um, and continue with questions. Uh, I'd just like to remind you that I have colleagues with microphones, and they will be able to, uh, to approach you if you indicate you have a question, so you can ask that, or you have the option of writing the, the uh, question on a piece of paper and passing it to the end of your row, uh, and our colleagues will co my colleagues will collect those and bring them to the head table if that's how you'd like to ask your question. Great. So my colleagues are ready for your questions. Our panelists are ready uh, with their answers, and we look forward to your, your thoughts, uh, reflections, and any questions you may have. I'm Bill Sweeney, and I guess the general question I was asked is why are we allowing so much early voting? Why do we not have all votes simply take place on election day, as is true in so many of the countries represented here? And do you think the trend towards early voting or a longer election period is what will happen in the United States? Sure. Um, let me answer that question um, in a couple of ways. Um, first, the trend to, toward early voting um, has start, you know, started about um, 15 years ago and is rapidly accelerated across the United States. And as I was saying, uh, you know, about you know, between 30 and 40 percent of all votes in this election will be cast early. And one of the reasons why election officials do this is um, we have a colleague um, named uh, Robert Stein, who's a professor at Rice University, who refers to um, voting as basically being like a consumer experience. And if you think about a consumer experience, the most important people are your, um, your frequent flyers, your people who engage in this activity all the time. And a lot of those people want convenience voting activities. So if you think about people who vote early, um, those people are often people who are partisans. So you know, there are Americans who could have told you on January 1st who they were going to vote for. Uh, they were either going to vote for President Obama or against him. And so for those people, voting early is very convenient. They know who they're going to vote for, and, and, they, and they vote in that way. And I generally think that this is going to be a trend because the other thing that early voting tends to do is it takes pressure off of uh, polling places on election day so that if I have more early voting, I have fewer voters coming on election day when there could be more problems because I have a mass of people all voting at once. And so there's kind of a twofold reason for early voting. One is to benefit these people, and the other one is to uh, relieve problems. Um, I'm going to let uh, Doug give his answer, and then I'm going to add one last thing at the end. Uh, thank you, Dad. I, I do think that we're going to see a continued expansion of early voting across the country. It's an interesting intellectual question. Um, I've had lots of people ask, do people like to vote before election day because they don't want to vote on election day or because they want to stay away from the traditional polling place on election day? Um, and we don't know the answer to that. Uh, the traditional neighborhood polling place that Thad showed in his slides um, is rapidly vanishing um, in this country. Um, one of the big issues in the next several cycles um, is the impact that early voting will have on election administration generally. Um, and Thad and I must have lots of colleagues. We have another colleague, um, Charles Stewart, at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. And Charles recently did some research that revealed that much of the error that had been wrung out of the American electoral process um, by moving from hand-counted paper ballots and punch cards to precinct count optical scan and electronic voting machines was in many ways being rung back into the process because voters are using um, early and absentee ballots, mostly that are mailed in. Um, having said that, I think I, I tell American election administrators all the time, um, like it or not, uh, the concept of election day really is expanding in such a way that um, it's no longer a question of if your voters want to cast ballots before election day, but how we will go about making that um, possible. Um, and so good or not, um, I, 
I don't know that we will add any new voters by expanding voting, but I, I suspect we may lose some voters by going back to a solely election day uh, experience. And how we handle that over the next several cycles is something I'll be really interested to see. Right. And the point I wanted to make is actually to build on the on um, the work that um, our colleague Charles Stewart has done. Um, people who vote early in person, so they basically replicate the voting experience of going to a polling place, but they do it in person. Those people tend to cast ballots and have the same error rates in making mistakes on their ballots as a traditional person who votes on election day. So, for instance, if you um, you know think back at one of the ballots I showed on here, what you know showed somebody making an error on an optical scan ballot. Um, but people who vote early by absentee voting, those people have two issues. One is when they mark their ballots at home or at work, they don't have the same technology to tell them that they've made a mistake. And secondly, they have to sign, they put their ballot in an inner envelope, uh, a privacy envelope, then they put that envelope in an outer envelope that they have to sign, and they often have to maybe check a box or something like that. People tend to make mistakes on that outer envelope, and then people tend to make mistakes on the ballot itself. And so one of the things we are seeing is that people who vote absentee do make more mistakes. They're less likely to have their ballots counted than are people who vote in a precinct or in an early voting in-person situation. And so that is one of the big problems that we're seeing right now with the expansion of, of by-mail absentee voting especially. Yes, thank you for that question to start us off. We have one question here in the, in the yeah. foreground, and we'll move to a second question and then take uh, the responses. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Michael. My name is Ahmed Zaka. I'm from Kenya. Like uh, electoral commission, uh, thank you very much, Tad and uh, Doug, for your presentation. Both early, both often. That is uh, a joke which is said uh, in other parts of countries where the potential for abuse of, of voting early. Uh, have you in, have you experienced that in the United States? Uh, how is that handled if there is a uh, uh, people abusing that right, uh, trying to go in our in our case? Uh, voting twice is actually uh, an offense. Number two, absentee ballots and the uh, postal ballots. When they are sent, are they counted the moment they are received? Or do you keep them and wait until the election day and then count them? If that is that, if that is the case, it means that there are millions of ballot papers across the United States sitting somewhere in stores waiting to be opened on fourth. How, secu how secure is that? What's the potential of abuse? Because I can't, I can't imagine it happening in some parts of the, uh, of the world where you could easily stuff the ballots again in the, where, where they, you keep those. And finally, please take us through the, the way you collate and you transmit the results. How do you eventually make a call that this person has won this state or this election? Uh, because you have said you have got so many states, so many electoral systems, but eventually you're able to say this guy has carried this state. Please take us through very briefly that how do you transmit results and say this is how you have won the election. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for those questions. We'll go to a second. Uh, my name is Fatima Fiki. I'm from Georgia. And uh, my one question is linked to this one, early voting results. Are they announced before or they are announced on the day? And another is about votes mailed. You mentioned that the, these uh, envelopes are signed. And in a country like my country, secrecy of vote is very important. And so in this case, then voters can be identified for whom they vote if the envelope is signed. So in this case, is not this a concern that there is no secrecy of vote in that case? Yes, very good questions. Before we go to our panelists for responses, I thank the two uh, participants who submitted questions in writing. Interestingly enough, they're both covered in the two questions that were just posed. We had a member of the Nigeria House of Representatives ask about why the results of early voting have not been announced. So I think it's, it's part of uh, Mr. Hassan's question. And also the, another question about the, trans, the response, whose responsibility is uh, for declaring election results. So again, a transmission and, and tabulation, uh, finalization of results question. Um, so. Doug and I were consulting about this, and I'm going to answer the second set of questions first about the ballot, um, how we do results, and then uh, and then Doug is going to talk a little bit about the, some of the security issues. Let me talk uh, first about 
the um, the way results are are transmitted and the uh, the way uh, they're announced. Um, first, there is a difference in the U.S. between the way results are announced in the media and the re and the actual results of an election. So we saw this in 2000 very vividly on election night where they called the state of Florida for Al Gore and then they called it for President Bush and then they called it for we're not sure and so it goes back and forth. What you will see happen though is on the close of the polls um, as it goes from across our, our time zones you will see um, election results called. Those will be based on exit polling so they will do exit polling and they will use preliminary results to determine who wins certain states. And given the fact that a lot of these states are very um, partisan toward one candidate or the other, it's pretty easy to call some of these states one way or the other. They'll wait longer to call states that are closer. So like the state of Ohio is likely to be called pretty late during the day. Um, so that's the media portion of that. So they use exit polls and they use preliminary results that they get from key precincts to let them know. Uh, the way this actually works, though, is that, um, as I was pointing out, there are about 10,500 local jurisdictions in the U.S. Each of those, juris in those, each of those jurisdictions, what generally happens is this. Uh, a polling place will close. They will um, open their ballot box. They will count the number of ballots they have to make sure it matches the number of people who signed in to vote. This is done in by groups of people, so it's not one person doing this. They will then seal those ballots in a bag. If they're electronic results, they'll compare the electronic vote totals to the number of people who signed in to vote. They will attempt to reconcile any problems that they have. They will put those into sealed um, bags that are um, numbered, people sign off for them. Those will be transported by two or more people to the central election office. Um, and either the results are tabulated in the central election office or if they've used a precinct tabulator, the results are then aggregated for all of the precincts in that jurisdiction. So that jurisdiction will then have the results. Then they transmit those to the state election office, to the secretary of state, and that gives them a preliminary election total. And in a place where they have lots of absentee ballots, what they will have done is over the course of the week, they may have separated the outer envelope that people signed from the inner envelope that's the secrecy ballot. So they, you, once they pull the ballots apart, that gi that's what gives you your, your secrecy. Then they will open those up, and then on election night at some point, they will tabulate all those absentee ballots, and those will again be included in the results that are sent up. And then over the course of the week or two weeks, or in the case of California, the month after the election, they will engage in, a, in a can, what they call a canvassing activity, where they go through each precinct, they check to see that the, the, the number of people who signed in equals the number of ballots. They'll do second checking of those. They'll check the electronic voting machines to make sure that those results equal what's on the paper record for those voting machines. Uh, they'll do what are called audits, where they audit a certain percentage of paper ballots and they'll re-hand count them to make sure that there was no mistake with the voting machines. And at the end of that process, the local governments will sign off on the results of the election and those will all be transmitted to the state who will then submit final election results uh, and say who the actual winners and losers are. But that process often takes 28 days and you will see, but you will see winners announced very quickly after the election um, in, in that. Yeah, and I, I have noticed in recent years, one of the legacies of the 2000 presidential election has been um, a decreasing willingness by candidates to concede or say that they have lost. Increasingly, you will see candidates say, we want to let the process run its course. We want to let the ballots be counted. Um, in the past where you would have seen um, a candidate um, congratulating his or her opponent and conceding the election, um, you see that a lot less these days. And so there is um, at least a greater recognition, if not universal recognition, that the election is not over uh, when the networks decide to call a winner uh, on election night. I want to talk a little bit about the fraud concerns and how absentee ballots 
uh, are counted um, and the like. I, the fraud concern is um, is ever present, and in fact, the debate we're having in the country right now about voter ID is between people who believe that voter fraud is rampant and other people who believe that the threat is overstated. Um, you do see lots of safeguards in state and local practice to mark individuals who are um, who have been given an absentee ballot or have cast a vote early to make sure that they don't turn up again on election day and cast um, a ballot. Um, the ID laws that are in place in many states are at least in theory designed to prevent an individual from um, um, circuit voting and going from polling place um, to polling place. Um, it is a concern and there are criminal laws in just about every state and locality um, making that kind of fraud um, illegal. Um, your follow-up question about voted absentee ballots, um, absolutely valid. Uh, we, um, as Thad mentioned, some jurisdictions will open vote-by-mail ballots and prepare them for counting, but universally no one actually counts the ballots until election day. So you have voted ballots in storage somewhere, which are the democratic equivalent of live ammunition, um, that you need to um, keep track of um, to make sure that no one tampers with um, the process. Uh, I would say that probably the state of Oregon is the most, um, is the farthest along in ensuring uh, the chain of custody of ballots um, like that. But as more and more states make early voting and especially vote by mail available, those kinds of end to end custody requirements are going to be incredibly um, valuable. And I think we've covered all the questions, right? Yes. Uh, my name is uh, Stefan Arnold. I'm with IFA Zimbabwe. I have two quick questions. One about early voting. Uh, if I use that facility and I cast my ballot, and then uh, a couple of days later there's a presidential debate, and my candidate of choice simply crashes and burns, and I hate this individual thereafter, is it possible for me to pitch up at my polling station and change my mind? Does that function exist in, in, in the US system? Secondly, um, we hear an increasingly okay. number of, of uh, pollsters, and the polls are coming out on a daily basis. Who's the winner, or who's the who's the uh, the person that's that's ahead? How credible are these pollsters now, since they are largely relying on landlines and less and less people do have landlines in, in or using landlines in, in the U.S.? So, are they increasingly getting more accurate or less accurate? Thank you very much. Okay, we'll take the. We'll go ahead and have a response, and then I have two. Um, my colleagues could come to the front. We have two uh, representatives at the front. We like to ask questions. Um, it was interesting that you used the phrase "crash and burn" um, because um, the issue of somebody changing their mind on the basis of debate isn't necessarily likely to happen, given how partisan people are who vote early. But there actually have been cases where um, they have had early voting in states, and then a candidate has died. And, in, and literally, there was a plane crash that killed uh, Senator Paul Wellstone in the middle of an election, and, and thousands of people had already voted for him. And so then the question became, how do you deal with that? And so that can be a big issue. Um, and I believe they resent out absentee ballots for those people. Yeah, the, yeah the, the rule was, and that's a problem. The short answer to your question is no, you can't change your mind. Right. Um, unlike, I know Thad can talk about Estonia and their system, that the, the vote that's counted is the last vote that's counted. Right. Um, one of my, uh, and this remark is intended to be humorous, that the one thing that every early voter has in common is that um, he or she is less undecided than other voters. Right. There are people who are willing to pay the time tax of, be, of, of forfeiting their right to change their mind because they're so certain uh, in the outcome. In Minnesota, what happened, and it, there were, it was controversial, is that voters who had voted for Wellstone's opponent, a man named Norm Coleman, did not have to do anything else but voters who had voted for Wellstone weren't allowed simply to transfer their votes to the new nominee, former Vice President Walter Mondale. Those voters actually had to get a new ballot and cast uh, a ballot, even though the result, it wasn't a change in mind, but a, 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 a crisis. And one of the pushbacks, one of the arguments against early and absentee voting in this country is the fact that you lose the right um, to change your mind. Now, whether or not the United States ever goes to Estonia's example right. and allows people to cast multiple ballots and just have the last one count, um, I think theoretically that's attractive, but if you listen carefully, that screaming sound you hear is American election administrators um, in unison right. saying no. Exactly. 
On the question of the polls, uh, there was actually a really nice talk yesterday by the pollster from the Washington Post at the uh, Smithsonian Institution, and the point he was making is exactly what you were saying, is that you know, it becomes, it's becoming much more difficult to poll people using telephones because um, you know, if you think about young people today, um, you know, large majorities of them, almost 90% of them, do not own a landline. And in the United States, it is not allowed under law for you to machine dial somebody uh, on, a, on a cell phone. You can do that for landlines. And so pollsters can use electronic dialing and even electronic survey methods um, on landlines, but they can't use them on cell phones. And so it becomes much more expensive to do that. But they, you know, these polls are still, they have come up with methodologies using a mix of landlines, cell phones, and internet to make polls still rather, um, they're rather accurate. Different polling firms have different, what are called house biases. So some polling firms have just slight biases one way or the other, uh, just because of the techniques that they use. But by and large, the polls are, are relatively accurate. And if you aggregate a cross poll, they tend to be extremely accurate. And this, and really quickly, this is a, actually a very hot topic here in the United States right now. I, I, I imagine we probably have more than a few um, sport fans here. But the debate over polling in the United States um, is very similar to some of the debates we've been having on the sports pages about whether statistics or in-person what's called eyeball scouting are more important. And there is a very deep divide of opinion between what in this country we call pundits, people who sort of read tea leaves and the headlines, um, and this new breed of statistician um, popularized by a man named Nate Silver, who has a blog called 538.com. Um, Silver purports to be able to take polls and give you a percent chance that one candidate will or won't win. And his record has been pretty good. But this cycle, there has been a tremendous pushback from the traditional pundits who say that what they're seeing in the headlines doesn't coordinate with what Silver's statistics show. And so in many ways, the results on Tuesday night um, are going to be the latest. Just like sporting teams use games as a bragging, an opportunity for bragging rights, pundits and Silver will do the same thing with the, the election results on Tuesday night. Very good. We'll take two questions and then have responses. Gentlemen, please. Yes, sir. I have a comment. It is based on what I heard. I felt that there is no system for elections in the United States, there is more than one system. And in fact, it is all different from each other. And I believe even in the procedures, they are different. And in many of our countries, we may have more developed systems, but what is unique about the United States systems is that it was able to achieve great progress in uh, and plans between the citizen and the and the state and the state and the citizens and that is a great accomplishment that can, should be taught and uh, to uh, and we must also uh, find out what is the, re, uh, the reason behind this great success because uh, um, uh, everybody is bound by public interest and uh, this is related to the civilization. And this is a great accomplishment. And if I have a choice between a developed system or uh, a non-confidence, I will choose confidence on the base, uh, over these developed systems if it is being managed in a way that is away from any uh, uh, bias. Yeah. Shukran. Sual akhar or ta'aliq akhar. Shukran Gazilan. Oh, yes. I'm from Nepal. I'm Chief Election Commissioner of Nepal. Um, I'm wondering uh, what we will be taking back to home from the USA. Um, we have heard that we are using so many types of polling, voting, different types of voting in different parts of the country, in different states. And if we allow to do that in the fledging democracy, are we in a position to manage so many different types of voting? And how can we educate our voters 
in different type of voting and counting and also the complexity of management. What would you suggest as the guru of electoral system management and also um, electoral system as such? Uh, what would you suggest us to take home from US election experience? Thank you very much. Um, thank you. Uh, very, actually, inter very interconnected they, they comments and questions. They actually are. And so um, let me answer them in one way, and I'm sure Doug will probably have a slightly different take on this. Um, you know, I think the two points you bring up are, are very, um, are, they're very important and they're very related. So the first question dealt with um, the issue of, of confidence in our system and why are people very confident in our system even though it's very decentralized and has these various um, quirks to them, basically, that makes it so, so different. But yes, people still are, are confident in the results. And if you think about after the 2000 election, where we had these problems, people still came around to, um, you know, being, ha you know, being or, or reconciling themselves with the results, even if they weren't happy with the results in a, in a political way. And I, I think that the answer is, is that we do have a unique political culture in the U.S. that, um, that, that both likes and, um, and recognizes the importance of decentralization. So we actually like the decentralized uh, nature of our system. And one of the benefits of that decentralization, and, and to go to your point of what to take away, is that you, know, you can see different states addressing problems in different ways to meet their specific political culture and needs. Different states have different political cultures. So the West Coast, for instance, they're very liberal about certain voting rules. So they are the people who, um, originated vote by mail. People really like the convenience voting that they do on the West Coast. And by contrast, in New England, people still like the traditional going to the polling place on election day. And so, you know, one of the things that's nice about the U.S. is that we balance political culture at the, at the state level with an election system that meets those needs. And so, for instance, in California, they have initiatives on the ballot so people can actually vote on changes they want to make to state laws and the state constitution. Whereas in other states, those things would not be allowed. And so I think that one of the things you can do in the US is to look across the various states at the rules and procedures and the things that they've put in place to try to find something that fits what works in your country and your, um, with, with the type of voters that you have. And, uh, and, and so I think that that's the, the nice thing about it. And you know, it, is, it is amazing, you know, we've had you know, 200, plus years of, of elections and people, um, you know, we've, we've had crises, but we've always come through them without problem. Um, weigh in um, briefly. Um, I think the gentleman, if I may paraphrase his comment, um, he says that um, although the American system is very decentralized, it appears to be very stable. Um, and it, it sounds to me like he prefers a stability of result to a formal structure, which many um, of you have. Um, and I'll be honest, in this country, we have an ongoing debate about that. Um, you have many people, not just um, experts, who ask why we don't have a uniform system uh, in this country. Um, I will be honest that um, having worked with the men and women who run elections in this country, I like our decentralized system. Um, I will tell you that not only being, having been trained as a lawyer, I've also um, have a degree in public administration. And I believe election administration is like public administration. Uh, and um, public administrators must find their citizens, their voters, their students, their taxpayers as they find them. Um, here in the United States, we have 50 states, and every state has a town called Springfield. And no two of them are alike. Um, they range from large metropolises, including a state capital, um, to small rural communities. Um, if every Springfield isn't alike, then I don't think every Springfield should be casting ballots alike. The challenge is to find the essence of voting, of registration, of ballot casting, of ballot counting, of dealing with voters at the polls in such a way that everyone is getting a similar experience without getting an identical experience. And we as a nation, as Americans, often find our way blindfolded and stumbling. Um, but just as the country has grown up organically from lots of little places, so has our um, electoral system. And so to the extent that you are considering what's the take home, um, to the extent that you have different communities 
and you can identify what the needs of those communities are, rural versus urban, um, homogeneous versus heterogeneous, um, even to the demographics of the population. If you decide that you want to try and tailor the experience for different communities, make sure you understand how those communities differ and how the things you want them to do similarly can change so that they're not necessarily identical. And I realize that is theoretical at about the 100,000 foot level, but I know that a gentleman from Nepal would be comfortable with high altitude. Citizens of the U.S. have not been registered as voters. Would it not amount to disenfranchisement of a citizen, which is, I believe, a denial of fundamental law to a citizen? And if so, whether this part lies with the election commission or with the citizen himself? Thank you. Um, the answer to that question is no. Not everyone in this country who is eligible is registered to vote. And in fact, um, my former colleagues at Pew recently came out with statistics that suggest something like um, between, I want to say 70 to 75 percent of the eligible population is actually registered. So um, as many as one in four um, are, and Thad is going to have a, a figure for me, but um, as many as one in four of the eligible population um, are not registered to vote. Um, if you are not registered to vote and are otherwise eligible, if you live in one of those same-day registration states, you do have the opportunity to register and cast a ballot on election day. If you do not, you cannot vote in this country. Again, because it is a voter-initiated and not a central um, um, civil registry list, not being on the list means that you are unable to cast a ballot on election day. Um, I often refer to my students, I tell them that voter registration is, at least in the United States, the admission ticket to democracy. And if you don't have a ticket, you cannot participate on election day. And that's why, had you been here uh, four, five, six weeks ago, you would have seen a tremendous push in this country to get people who were not registered to register to vote and people who were registered to make sure that their information is up to date on election day. Because in the vast majority of states that do not have same day registration, if you're not on the list, you don't cast a ballot. Right, and if you look at the data here, you can see about 70% of people in the U.S. are registered to vote. So those are the two blue lines. And, um, you know, most people are registered to vote in a presidential election, but it's getting those people registered that's the problem. And a lot of those people are, tend to be young people who move, who are in college, who've had some sort of change in their address, to, and they don't get uh, registered. Um, and, that's, and that's the biggest, um, you know, one of the big problems are people who have life changes that lead to them not being registered to vote. And then some people just don't want to participate. They don't want to register and they don't want to vote for whatever reason and we don't, we don't make them participate. Yes, we have time for two more questions. Thank you for your patience. Just two more questions. We have one in the back that's been waiting patiently. Thank you. Yes. We have the other two in the back. Okay. The two in the back. Okay, so we'll have another one that's overlooked. Uh, what's going on? Going Hi, 全国的一个总的一个计票的一个结果 谢谢 My question is, in China, we have 1.3 billion population. So compared with 100 million U.S. Um, population, uh, we will have a difficulty to count and collect the votes. So I would like to hear your suggestion, opinion about how we're going to hold the votes together and count them and also how to be accurate to conduct the process. Thank you. Okay, we'll take another question in the back. It's been waiting patiently before moving to the answers and responses. This is a question from Armen Sambatyan, Secretary of the Central Election Commission of, of Armenia. And the question is, uh, do you think that early voting and the publication and publishing the results of early voting does have an impact on the formation of public opinion. 
Okay, we're going to take another question before I have. Oh, yes, sir. I'm Patricio Valdez. I'm a minister of the Supreme Court of Chile and chairman of the Electoral Court. From the background and information you've given us today, I have read something that actually brings about questions, at least from and about the Constitution of the United States. And the question is as follows. I understand that since this is a federated country, the candidate that wins by one vote in each state takes all of the electors in that state. That's a system that has always worked. And in the counterpart to that is that you have two senators per state, and in some cases you have more senators than representatives due to the population. But from the information you've given us here, you've said that in almost all states, the one who gets just one more vote is a take-all, that is, takes all of the electoral votes. However, there are two states in the United States, i.e. Nebraska and Maine, where there's a proportional representation. So, in my opinion, or could you clarify the situation? Isn't that something that violates violates equal voting in the federal system? Has nobody gone against it or complained about that? Because in my opinion, the vote of those two states would seem to have more value, that is, the minority vote would have more value in those two states than in the other states. That's the question I'd like to ask. Thank you very much. We will uh, attempt to, ad to address those three disparate uh, topics. First, I'd like to ask uh, the vote vote counting question from our Chinese participant to, to be addressed. Sure. Um, I think that the, you know, the answer to that, the question about, you know, voting in China is basically expanding the population just expands the, um, the managerial issue that you have to do across, you know, the various cantons in, in, in China, but it doesn't make, uh, I don't think there's anything special about what you'd have to do to, to count and aggregate those votes. It's still going to be a process of getting ballots from a precinct to some sort of intermediate level to the, the central government. Um, and so I think that the answer there is just, um, you know, how that process is going to work. Uh, on the question about early voting, um, although people do vote early, those results are never released and their votes are never tabulated until election day. Those, so those voting machines are taken to a central, the central election office, they're, they're secured, and then those ballots will not be tabulated or counted until the polls have closed across a state on election day. So those vote results are never known. Um, what people do do instead is pollsters will do surveys to try to find survey results that show what, how, which way early voters voted, but they will not, but those are not real results. Right, and then the other um, uh, technique which is currently being used, and, and we didn't talk about this, but in, in some states, again, not all states, um, voters, um, can register with one or another political party. And so you have some political scientists, um, including yet another one of our colleagues, a man named Michael McDonald of George Mason University, who has been gathering information from the various states and determining how many registered Democrats have voted early and how many registered Republicans have voted early. And while that's not necessarily have a strong predictive power, I think there's some suggestion that that's how those voters might um, otherwise um, cast a ballot. And there is some um, uh, disagreement um, right now as to whether or not those numbers should be released, um, and if so, do they have an impact on um, the process. Um, and finally, I want to address um, um, uh, uh, Mr. Justice from um, Chile. Had I, had I known that we had a Supreme Court justice um, in the House, I would have been much more precise in my description of um, the American uh, electoral system um, the, the, the Constitution gives the federal government um, power over elections, but um, a key piece of that, Article One, Section 4, says that states may determine the time, place, and manner um, of conducting such elections. And under that time, place, and manner authority, states like Maine and Nebraska have decided to change the traditional winner-take-all um, uh, aggregation of the Electoral College and go to a congressional district by congressional district allocation. There has been some interest in other states in doing that. 
um, as well, but to date only those two jurisdictions have done that. Now, for those of you who follow American politics, what's interesting is that the one congressional district in each state, which tends to march out of step with the rest of the state, cancels each other out. You have, usually it's a Democratic district in Nebraska, which tends to vote Republican, and a Republican district in Maine, which tends to vote Democratic. So on the whole, it's as if those states were still winner take all. Now there have been some moves afoot to change the, Congre the Electoral College to require that any, that if a number of states agree to it, to uh, recognize the, the, the leader of the popular vote as the winner of the Electoral College, but for the time being, states basically, other than the times when they're supposed to report back to the federal government and, 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 and deliver those names to the federal government, how those folks are chosen is allowed to be a creature of state law. Um, and if that seems odd to you, you have lots of company. We did have a uh, question in writing from a participant from Nigeria, Dr. Naruru Chakuba, who was asking about the Electoral College system. We hope that response addressed your question, which was very much okay. I have a question from uh, the National Electoral Commission of Angola in Portuguese. First, does the United States have a database of voters? Second, how do you guarantee that there is no duplication of votes? And third, the system used in the United States guarantees uh, viability of voting, but how do you do so with early voting? Uh, the answer is no, there is no U.S. database of voters. There is no single federal database like there is in other countries. Um, individual jurisdictions prevent against double voting um, through a lot of the safeguards that we've looked at, uh, we've talked about already, um, but there are concerns that there are multiple uh, um, uh, names on the rolls, and that's something that states are working to reduce. And the viability of early voting, early voting is really no different from traditional voting other than the time and place where it occurs. So all other safeguards, registration list, requirement of observation, what have you, that would apply in regular voting applies in early voting as well. The gentleman right yes, in the front. we're going to microphone to the front row. This will be our last question. Thank you very much for your, uh, your enthusiasm. Thank you very much for giving an opportunity. Uh, I, I am Justice Retired Shahzad Akbar Khan from Pakistan, Member Election Commission. Uh, with reference to a question, answer that has been given by Mr. Raj, if all the eligible citizens of U.S. have not been registered as voters, uh, would it not amount to disenfranchisement of a citizen, which is, I believe, uh, a, a denial of the fundamental law to a, a citizen? And if so, whether this fault lies with the election commission or with the citizen himself? Um, Thank you for that final question. Uh, let me just, uh, you know, uh, I think Doug made um, this point at the outset, which is that in the United States, um, we have no constitutional right to vote. And so people, what we've done is pass a series of laws that make people eligible to vote, but we, but people have to be proactive in the registration. And that's part of our political culture is that we expect people to register themselves to vote and then to subsequently, you know, turn out to vote. And so, you know, so the general answer to your question is, is that, you know, people are not automatically registered and people are expected to take the, make the effort to register we generally consider the registration requirements to not be very onerous. Um, you know, you can register when you get your driver's license, when you get other government services, when you, uh, people come to your door, you can fill out a form. In many states now, you can register to vote online. And so we've made registration rather easy. And, you know, people who, in political science, we generally, you know, view that people who aren't registered don't want to vote. And if you actually look at the not, reasons why people are not registered, the two most common reasons why people are not registered to vote is because they do not like the two parties and they don't think the two parties represent their views. And we live in a country with just two parties. And so for people who don't think either party represents them, they just don't want to participate in the process. And so that's why uh, most people who aren't registered actually are not registered. And I think to answer your question, I think that there are, I think Thad's right, that I think the vast majority of people who are not registered are people who choose not to register. I think that a lot of the activity we see on the margins in election law is to identify people who want to be registered and have no ability uh, to do so. Uh, and so you're starting to see interest in uh, identifying, in many states, 
uh, both political leanings have started to reach out to their unregistered but eligible voters in an effort to get them on the rolls. Uh, so there is some interest in, uh, uh, you don't hear discussions of fundamental law, but I think that people at least here feel organically that there is something wrong with the system where people who are eligible aren't actually registered and want to do what they can right. to change that. Okay. And the final, just to make a, one final point, I think that if you think about politics from the, from the perspective of politicians who make the rules, they like the system as it is because they understand what these pools of voters look like. If I all of a sudden make it where another 30% of Americans are eligible to vote, it may change the dynamics of elections in ways that either party, they, may, they don't know what's going to happen. And so in some ways, they like the system the way it is because they know what the rules of the game look like. And so changing the rules of the game could be problematic. We need we need a microphone. We'll need a microphone. Right. Okay. We've addressed this this short brief question. I'll give the final word to our chairman Peter Kelly. I I could not disagree with you more. Um, politicians sitting waiting, making sure things would be just as they are. Matter of fact, we like change because change gives you a chance. To expand, so I really disagree with that. Well, I'm a politician. Well, you you like change if you think it's going to benefit you. Exactly. Right. <laughs> and, and we can agree on something. And it always will if you do what you do right. So exactly. thank you. On that note of accord, uh, I call the end to this plenary session. Thank you very much. Um, if you didn't have a chance to answer your question, I know there were several of you I could not get to. Um, rest assured, our two panelists will be at the welcome reception uh, at seven o'clock this evening. Uh, we hope you all make it uh, and be part of that event. Uh, please join me in thanking both uh, Doug Chapin and Thad Hall. Thank you.